Welcome to the Practice Brave Podcast. I am the host, Brianna Battles, founder of Pregnancy and Postpartum Athleticism and CEO of Everyday Battles. I'm a career strength and conditioning coach, entrepreneur, mom of two wild little boys, and a lifelong athlete. I believe that athleticism does not end when motherhood begins, and this podcast is dedicated to coaching you by providing meaningful conversations, insights, and interview topics related to fitness, mindset, parenting, and of course, all the nuances of pregnancy and postpartum. From expert interviews to engaging conversations and reflections, this podcast is your trustworthy, relatable resource for learning how to practice brave through every season in your life. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Practice Brave Podcast. Today I'm here with Dr. Luke Pomerantz, and he is an orthopedic surgeon out of San Diego. And I'm really excited today to talk to him because we're going to be talking about sport injuries, specifically for combat sport athletes, which he is a black belt in jiu-jitsu, and he will give us a lot more information on his athletic background um, and professional. But I'm really excited to have his scope and conversation today. So Dr. Luke, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So give us a little bit of background on, we'll start with your athletic background. Sure. So sports have always been a big part of my life. Yeah. That combination of things, just the way my brain and body work, I needed to be moving and sports gave me that outlet. I was very small growing up, one of those late bloomers. And so I, I found wrestling, which had weight classes, which kind of worked a little bit better for me. Um, and then, yeah, I, I kind of had this, I guess, extra satisfaction of, of the grappling part of things, the direct interaction and, and, and pushing and pulling that you got from wrestling. And then a coach got introduced me to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And that was, I was fortunate enough to be an early adopter. That was the, the late 90s. And in Santa Cruz, California, Garth Taylor Awesome guy, uh, legend in Santa Cruz, got me got me into jujitsu with Claudio Franza, and it's been a part of my life since. Uh, certainly, there's been starts and stops along the way, but it's always been a kind of a common thread of at least something I wanted to get back to when I had to take some time off. Absolutely, and I love that you mentioned that because we see so often, I think people who get immersed in jujitsu, especially maybe like by the time they're like a blue belt, it is so a part of their life, but it. I think there's just different seasons where that volume or the intensity of your training has to kind of adapt to the season you're in. If you're truly going to pursue what I like to call a lifetime of athleticism in a specific sport. Without a doubt. Uh, I mean, anything, if you're going to sustain doing it um, for a lifetime, which is the goal to be active your whole life, um, you, you approach things differently. And yes, you know, guys who have ambitions to be a world champion, they're going to train very differently with a different intensity and different goals than, than you or I who have other things going on in life, but want to be in the sport. So yeah, it's a struggle to find that longevity. Sometimes time uh, is not on your side, but, but if you make it a priority, you can always get back to it. Absolutely. So now tell us a little bit about your professional background and the current work that you're doing. And then did sport lead into that at all? Give us some context here. Yeah. Um, so orthopedic surgery, we, we, we are kind of the, the specialists of bones and muscles and joints. And that usually then leads us to the, the surgeons that work on motion and movement. And so we're very much involved in sports. And a lot of us did sports growing up. We're, we're kind of have the, the, the uh, stereotype of being the jocks of the medical world for good and bad. And, you know, a lot of us have had injuries and we got introduced to an orthopedic surgeon through that. And that kind of piqued our interest. And we go from there. Um, but yeah, my, my progression through medicine, it was kind of an idea. I worked hard in high school. I got good grades, but being a doctor certainly wasn't uh, the goal at the time. And there wasn't pressure on me to do it either. Uh, in college, it was kind of doing the pre-medical classes, keeping the door open. And when I started doing well, it was like, okay, it's still there. But it was later in college that I kind of like, all right, medicine's where I want to go. But it, it wasn't until much later in medical school that that orthopedic surgery kind of became something I realized I liked. Uh, it was a matter of throwing myself into everything and, and orthopedic surgery is what stuck. 
Yeah. What was it about orthopedic surgery that like really spiked your interest? Yeah, it it's so to generalize it, it's carpentry. It's, it's using your hands. It's using hammers and chisels and saws. And so you're, you know, there's that, that kinesthetic kind of thing where you're, you're getting uh, your own motion to happen. And it's gratifying because you can do things to people who, who need help and immediately see results. A lot of medicine is not that way. It can be hard uh, where, you know, you're tried trading medications and you're doing other things and you don't see those immediate or close to immediate uh, uh, results. But, you know, someone falls, breaks their hip, they can't walk what used to be a death sentence. Now we do our surgery and the next day they're walking. And that is really cool. That that is uh, something that's really special about orthopedic surgery. So you're really special. What is your favorite surgery to perform? Oh, okay. Well, it's hard to pick just one. And I ended up specializing in hand surgery. Kind of two thirds what I do is kind of the elbow down. Um, I, I mean, I, it would be impossible for me to pick just one within hand surgery. I, I hope you can understand that there, there's some good ones. Uh, I do like fracture care, uh, broken bones. Uh, you know, the, the carpentry of things is fun. But like I was alluding to kind of one of the most gratifying things is, is someone with a broken hip and you bring back their ability to walk the next day. So whether it's a partial hip replacement or there's other ways of fixing the broken hip, those are, those are great surgeries. Those are fun. Okay. Did you get interested in hand surgery because of your experience in martial arts? Is that what spiked that or what? You know, it, it just like all of my decisions and that kind of stuff, there was never like a plan. It was kind of trying things out, seeing what I liked, and it was probably a lot of things contributing to it. Certainly, I saw the importance of hands with me trying to use them. Um, you see injuries in martial arts, and you're like, oh, I wish I knew how to make that better or prevent it or whatever. What's also cool about hand surgery, beyond the fact that how important our hands are to our function is just the the involvement of a lot of different systems. We, we get extra training in how to deal with blood vessels and wound care and nerves and tendons. And so we, we kind of get this little bit more broad um, skill set than, than just dealing on with bones. And that, that was something that, that intrigued me as well. Yeah, I imagine hands are so complex because there's so many tiny little bones and tendons there. And <laughs> yeah. Like a big puzzle. <laughs> it, it, it is, it, you know, the biomechanics of our hands are, it's truly remarkable just how, how it happened. And um, yeah, lots of nerves, lots of tendons, lots of nerve endings. The, the amount of our brain that's given to our hands is, is huge, uh, disproportionately huge. You know, if you've ever seen what's called the homunculus, you know, that, that weird looking human structure that that kind of demonstrates how our brain allocates resources. The hands are a huge part of that. Um, and what we're able to do with them is cool. I mean, whether it's swinging a mallet or playing the piano, it's extraordinary what our hands can do for us. I love it. That's such a great perspective because I think that we, us like normal people don't think of it that way. We certainly take our hands and that function for granted. Yeah. And unfortunately, I mean, that's how a lot of us are. And then something happens and you go, Oh, yeah. Oh, I really oh. did need my thumb or my wrist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So speaking of, you see a lot of different injuries um, being immersed in the combat sports world. So what are some of the top injuries that you see in combat sports? Yeah, so combat sports bring just, there's so many different parts of combat sports that can contribute to an injury. There's the obvious overt impact of things, you know, similar to football, you know, uh, the leg kicks or the strikes to the, to the, with the hands, all of those things can cause injuries. Then of course there's wear and tear. It's a hard, hard game to be in, especially if you're trying to do things at an elite level and things can wear you down, especially if you're not recovering appropriately. Uh, so arthritis and just eventual ligament tears and things like that are all, all part of it. But common things being common, you've got the, the ACL injury, the anterior cruciate ligament, where the, the, the knee buckles and 
this important ligam ligament for knee stabilization goes. See that frequently. It's it's in jiu-jitsu, it's in MMA, it's it's in every sport, it's soccer, basketball, it's everything. Um, uh, other frequent ones within the world of combat sports, focusing on the hands, you get metacarpal fractures. There's the classic boxer boxer's fracture, which is the fifth metacarpal and sometimes the fourth metacarpal and, and things like that. Uh, an interesting thing about combat sports beyond that, and I think that the gloves contribute uh, where they end is kind of right, right closer to the body than what we call the PIP joint, the proximal interphalangeal joint. And then the fingers are hidden. And there's a lot of force that goes into the hands when we're parrying a punch or a kick. And our, our fingers will be hyperextended uh, over those gloves. And you'll see these, these dislocations at the proximal interphalangeal joint that become fairly common. Um, Jiu-jitsu is hard on the fingers, just wearing a gi, those things. Yeah, there, there's, there's a lot of things that can come up in combat sports. Yeah. And we, we see that. And I think, you know, there's, of course, like you said, those impact injuries, but I feel like there's so many injuries that are just attributed to like overtraining, or there's maybe not a balance to the training efforts where it's just, it's so easy to, I call it like drink the jujitsu Kool-Aid where that's all you want to do. <laughs> yeah. And like the, like any kind of cross training gets put to the sideline. Do you feel like that contributes to why we see a higher incidence of just injuries or people that are kind of chronically in pain and complain about their back or their shoulder. Yeah. Maybe. No, it's, it's a huge contributing factor. Uh, I mean, any sport it's recommended that you cross train, you've got to balance things out within the world of combat sports. There's, you know, you're protecting yourself. There's this shell that you'll create with your arms, for example, in boxing or MMA or even jujitsu. You don't want people to get under hooks. So your elbows come in, your shoulders roll forward. You kind of hunch down and that's good for the combat sport but it's horrible for your shoulders, for example, and, you know, getting your shoulder blades down and back and opening up those shoulders, it's huge. And you have to work at those things. You have to do the exercises to build the strength, to get your shoulder blades down and back that a lot of people neglect. And it, it, in the story, it, I mean, it just occurs in a lot of different situations and a lot of different body parts where they're not balanced and it opens them up for, for injury of that wear and tear that eventually will catch up to anybody if they're not careful. Absolutely. I feel like the culture and at least jujitsu specifically, that's what I actually feel like I can speak to. Um, there doesn't seem to be as much of a priority on having cross training. The culture seems to be very, um, do more jujitsu if you want to get better at jujitsu. And so yeah. that kind of takes away from um, supporting, pursuing other aspects of fitness. Do you feel like you've, seen yeah. you've been in the game oh. for so long? <laughs> Definitely. And, and, and I get it. You know, you, you want to get good at jujitsu and yes, doing jujitsu is what makes you better at jujitsu. What through the repetitions and the learning, the technique and the sparring, that is how you get better at jujitsu. But, <laughs> uh, you know, kind of the taking a one step back to take two steps forward. If longevity is, is your goal. And like we were kind of alluding to earlier, it should be the goal you have to find a balance and you have to set aside a little extra time. It doesn't have to be a lot to regain balance and flexibility and strength or range of motion um, to, to be able to keep going. And because if you don't do those things, then you can't train jujitsu and you're not getting better at jujitsu. There's kind of that point of diminishing returns. Oh yeah. 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 You, you got to balance it up. There's balance in everything. Absolutely. So how do you suggest athletes manage training and their approach with orthopedic health in mind? Of course, some of the things we talked about with cross training, but what other aspects are good supplemental variables? Yeah. So, I mean, th these aren't going to be huge secrets, but allowing time to recover, uh, it's hard. And when you're young, you feel like you're indestructible, but if you don't give yourself time to recover, and that includes rest and stretching and nutrition and actual sleep hydration goes into that too all of those things i mean you all we all intuitively know it but we all we all usually neglect those things unfortunately um huge huge important things uh that prevent injuries if if you're taking care of yourself absolutely and so what do you suggest if somebody gets injured and maybe it's not like a, a really crazy injury where anything's broken, but 
they tweak their knee and they're limping off the mat or something happens to their shoulder, maybe an arm bar gone too far. What is the protocol that we're recommending these days? Is ice still a thing? Is heating still sure. a thing? Like a lot of that has changed. So hit me. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. You get an injury. And of course we can always talk about, you know, are you hurt? Are you injured? You know, that kind of old PE coach yeah. from, from a long time ago thing. Um, well, first I'll point out that no injury, even if it's not severe, should be ignored. Um, it's, there are some things you can push through and you've got to, you know, if you've got a competition coming up or it happens in competition and you can keep going, all right, you, you may have to keep going. Uh, the problem comes where if you start really working around something, your biomechanics, the way you move your body starts changing, you start having imbalances. Uh, and you really see it with the, the, the complex movements, such as throwing or, you know, it could be passing the guard. But if you're favoring your right knee and you start putting more weight on the left leg and you shift how your hips move, it's going to open you up to injuring something else. So you can't neglect an injury. You can't just work around it necessarily. You got to take some time off. And so with that being said, all right, the immediate injury, what do you do? Um recovery, like we were talking about rest, giving your, the body part a chance to heal is important. Um, now the debate uh, between ice or anti-inflammatory, if you ice something, you are reducing the swelling, you're reducing the blood flow to an area, you are reducing the pain, whether it's by reducing the swelling or kind of deadening the nerves in the area. And those can be helpful. And there is some theoretical risk that you are inhibiting the healing process. Inflammation for an injury is what we want. It's how our body heals. It's bringing extra blood flow to an area. It's bringing extra cells for healing to an area that that's how we heal. And so you don't necessarily want to inhibit that, but icing something is not going to make it so you don't heal. It just doesn't work that way. Your body can overcome those obstacles. And so I'm fine with people trying to ice or wrapping something. Um, and sometimes it's a, it's a necessity, whether it's you or I, we have other jobs. We, we have other things we need to do. And so don't torture yourself by, oh, I don't want to inhibit healing. You know, my elbow hurts. I'm going to, I'm going to have a little wrap on it. I'm going to put some ice on it so I can go and operate later. You know, there are things you got to work around and, and it's a hard balance to find, but no, I don't think icing or taking an ibuprofen means all of a sudden it's going to ruin everything, but you do have to keep those things in mind. And it's a dichotomy. It's a balance that, that everyone should strike. And I do want to point out that inflammation is not the enemy. It's a good thing to a point. <laughs> I do appreciate that you touched on that. Cause I do feel like we're always seeing uh, conflicting input out there on like how to, how to manage like the, the first response to an injury, what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Um, and yeah, I think that's really helpful. So are there, yeah. um, you mentioned like a brace, for example. So if somebody, they hurt their knee a couple of weeks ago, they're wanting to come back to training. Do you suggest wearing a brace or are you more in the camp of like kind of feeling where your body's actually at without the structural support? So yeah, a few things on that. Um, Yes, braces sometimes can make it so you're not using something the way you should. And like I was talking about, it alters your biomechanics if you're too dependent on the brace. But sometimes initially wearing a brace is a good idea for a few reasons. One, it shows other people around you that, hey, you know, training partner, be, be a good training partner and don't heel hook my right, right leg because my knee's in a brace, you know. Um, it's also a reminder to you that. Hey, like, be careful. Um, and sometimes, at least in an initial period of time, a brace can be helpful to keep you moving, keep you doing things, and help prevent uh, more injury. Uh, so I think they can be beneficial. But yes, if they become a crutch, then then there's other things that should be addressed, and it, it shouldn't be just this band aid. And you should probably do something else about it. So someone, if they've had knee pain for most of their life, do you think that with a brace is like kind of chronically training with a brace is going to be helpful for them? 
in those kind of situations where they've had knee pain since college or whatever, maybe yeah. an old injury, like there's lots of old injuries that come up, right? Sure. And I'll say this. So obviously I hope the underlying cause of the knee pain is being addressed the best it can. Um, you know, arthritis, if someone has arthritis, there's no cure for arthritis and motion is for the most part good for arthritis. But if the knee braces keep their knees from bending too far, which helps them stay in the game and keeps them happy and physically fit. All right. You know, use those knee braces if you got it. But if you've got some muscle imbalances and your patellar tendon gets fired up because you haven't addressed those muscular imbalances. And so you throw on a brace. Well, that that's a situation where um, you might cause more injury by, by wearing the brace and not going after the underlying problem. Absolutely. That makes sense. So we have seen, um, we've seen a big uptick in supplemental treatments for injuries, right? Like Mm -hmm. maybe steroids or stem cells and different things like that, that are maybe on the horizon or actually regularly. Can you uh, talk to us a little bit about that? (laughs) So yes, this in itself is a broad (laughs) topic that we could delve into for a very, very long time. Um, General philosophy of mine, our bodies are amazing and have an amazing ability to heal from injury if we give it the chance. Um, So is a supplement that may be very expensive going to be a game changer that makes it so you heal something that you wouldn't have otherwise healed? You know, I have my doubts depending on what it is and how it's being sold. Um, Now, within the world of combat sports, there's stuff, you know, people just throw out the term peptides. Oh, peptides. <laughs> All right. Uh, peptides, proteins. Okay. You know, sure. I think there is some growing evidence that some of those things out there could help. Maybe um, a lot of them, such as BPC 157, which is really hot right now. There's no good research on humans for me to hang my doctor hat on and go. Yeah do it and use it this way and use it in this dose and you'll totally get benefit. I can't say those things. I think the safety profile is one that I don't think it's doing harm. You know, peptides don't necessarily alter your, 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 the way your cells work the way say supplementing testosterone does. Um, You know, when you get into the hormonal level of things, you're influencing a lot of other body systems and I'm hesitant to recommend those. I think clearly they can be beneficial, certainly uh, with a short-sighted view on things, TRT or steroids or however you want to view the testosterone supplementation growth hormone and goes in that too, can be huge. We, We see it all the time in professional sports where they help, they do good things and it's, they make you stronger. They help you recover faster. Um, so they can be huge. The problem is the the long-term benefits or the long-term costs may become an issue. And I think more research is growing and we could find the right dose at the right time with the right people. Um, And it's probably going to be a very individual thing that is the right way to go. Uh, But more, just because a little works, more doesn't mean better. And so I'll I'll throw that one out there for the, for the steroids and the, the, well, in professional sports, theoretically illegal supplements. Right. Yeah, it's just been so interesting seeing um, just within even the last couple of years, the amount of information coming out and what people, especially in the combat sports community, there's a kind of like a YOLO added to attitude towards all of that stuff. Well, if this is her, I'm just going to inject this or take that or get these. And uh, it just seems there's a lot more trial out there. <laughs> Yeah, it it is interesting. People are more willing to experiment on themselves or maybe take that Instagram post from someone who's not really into nuance and subtlety that in 30 seconds says something is great and they, you know, people buy in, go up, go all out. It's an interesting phenomenon. And, you know, it's not way that my brain works. You know, I, I, I wish there was more nuance and subtlety out there. It's not as exciting. Um, 
but, and it's not necessarily how you sell things either. Uh, so it is interesting. And maybe within the world combat sports, maybe people are a little more aggressive and they're a little more extreme and they're a little more kind of like, I need performance now type of person. Um, but I think, you know, for the most part, younger people or people who are really performance driven tend to go after, go after things. And you see it, you see it all the time. Yeah. Cause I think, you know, for a lot of people, you know, especially in combat sports and again, more specifically jujitsu, you, there's so much FOMO attached to it. And maybe that's just our growth and maturity in the sport. But like, I know where I'm at, you know, it's so hard to get sidelined and you feel like you're really, um, that you're like really losing progress or you're going to lose progress. And that it just becomes like this psychological warfare that you have with yourself if you are injured. And so then I do think there's that desperation of like, I'll take whatever, I'll do whatever in order to like get back out there and make it part of my routine again so that I'm not like missing out and everyone's not getting better than me. And like almost that vicious cycle that really heavily influences people's mental health in jujitsu. Oh yeah. I, it's a great, great point that you, you, that you've seen. And I, yeah, I, you see it all the time. There is a community within jujitsu. You're going to miss out on your friends and there is some competition there. You don't want to fall behind all of those things have go in. And yeah, so injuries can be rough. They're rough no matter what, but when you're that much more driven and goal oriented, and now you can't do those things. Um, yeah, you, you're going to seek out easier solutions. Uh, and now speaking from personal experience recently, I, I recently had my own injury. That was pretty big setback. I, I needed a, a pec repair. I, I tore my pec doing jujitsu 25 years, avoiding major injury and just bad luck. And man, it was rough. Uh, I know it. I hear it. I feel it. Um, and a few things came out of it. Um, one, yes, there's torture. You're seeing your friends have fun and learn and get better and you're not there doing it. Um, but I would still go to the gym and I would still see them. I'd still get, you know, the camaraderie of seeing my friends and I'd still be able to learn something, still scout, see what, see what some of the guys are working on. So they can't surprise me when I do come back. Um, and it's motivating, like, all right, I'm going to work on my rehab that much harder so I can get back sooner so I can be with my friends and learn and do all the things I love to do. Um, but it's also given me a different outlook. And I've now gone back to I'm drilling more. I, I am I'm not sparring as much because I shouldn't yet, but I I'm drilling and I'm kind of noticing little subtle things that maybe I kind of didn't even notice because I hadn't drilled the move a hundred times. And it's like, Oh, look at that. Oh, Hey, now this thing that I was pretty good at, I thought I was pretty good at now I'm, I'm better. And it's all because I took this step back to start, you know, working around the injury and, and get into it. So there are lots of ways to work around an injury. Don't rush it recover. And it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. Yeah. I love that perspective. And I think that just also speaks for so much maturity in the sport. Like you've been in the game a long time and it's like the logical coach brain in me can know, like I can acknowledge that I can see that I can preach that. And then like the athlete brain part of me, there's just so much eagerness, like, well, I can do another training session, or maybe I'll do this, or maybe I'll do that. There's just always that like desire to like push boundaries. But I think that I would assume as years go on in the sport, and of course, with everything you've been exposed to um, as a surgeon, it probably gives you a little bit more perspective or easy to implement that perspective. Yeah, it's rough. Huh? As we get older and with more experience, we we come to it with a better understanding. Um but unfortunately, you have to live it and experience it to to truly understand it. And um, so, yeah, it, it, it's hard. But hopefully, you you know, you got good coaches. You got people telling you things and guiding guiding uh, the people out there uh, to make the right decisions. I think that is an, a hard part of it too. Not just in jujitsu and combat sports is the coaching culture of the expectations of the gym or of the coach, a kind of like push through it 
mindset or um, it's not that bad or you've done jujitsu or you're doing jujitsu kind of get used to being injured or get used to training in pain. Like that's a kind of a common sentiment I've seen um, come up in the last four ish years of being in it myself. Sure. Sure. Yeah. It, there is a culture um, combat sports. You're going to have a little more machismo. You're going to have a little more aggression. You're going to have those types of people. And those type of people are going to certainly view things differently than, than perhaps people who are really into yoga. Um, no, there's a cool little Venn diagram of people who who do both. Uh, and so I think there is going to be some cultural changes. And I think the smarter people or the people who are t- able to take a step back and like, all right, why do we do this? Why do we think this way? There's a little bit more emphasis on, on the recovery of things and not necessarily pushing through what's truly an injury. But the balance is to be good at a combat sport. You're going to deal with discomfort. You're going to have to work through things that aren't fun, that kind of suck. Um, and and so, yeah, it, it's going to be finding coaches who can see what's going on and realize, hey, you got to take you got to take a break. You know, you, you work on this, drill this. You're not going to spar right now. And and. What's interesting is in my my time doing some boxing, I noticed that that culture of coaching much more than I had seen in jujitsu or wrestling, um, where I had coaches where I wanted to get down and spar, and that's as a wrestler, that's you know what the coaches want. They want you out there going. They want you to grind. But the guy's like, no man, you sparred hard yesterday. You you need to you need to rest. And it's like, oh. oh. <laughs> Oh, okay. You know, so I, I think there'll be a sophistication as the culture grows. Um, I hope the sophistication comes, but the coaches are also going to need to push some people and go, Hey, you got it. You got to do it. You got to push, you got to go. Cause that's the only way to get better at anything. And then combat sports hurt. <laughs> and it's such a great conversation around like really building discipline in people and then also building adaptability within that discipline like what does that look like because some people think discipline yeah. go harder go more more intense more 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 but adaptable discipline is you're still participating but you're adaptable in your approach and that is an art to try to figure oh, yeah. out for yourself nevertheless communicate as a coach um you used two words that i think are are crucial and that's discipline and adaptability for everything, uh, for everything, uh, to be a, a good surgeon and a good coach and to be good at the sport you're trying to do, you have to have those things. And if you're rigid, you you can't adapt. And it's all about being able to adapt, whether it's overcoming injury or learning a new technique, not realizing that you've got control over everything and know everything. You have to be able to adapt and you have to be focused and you have to kind of put the time in and that requires discipline and and that adaptable uh discipline as you mentioned it, it's a great way of viewing things to be one able to learn fast and two to stay in the game absolutely and that's the goal is to honestly like we do jujitsu to not just make the black belt but then beyond like this is one of the what i love so much about jujitsu is is a sport that you can truly participate in at any age and for any duration, soccer likely ends around 22, unless you do like pickup, right? Same with basketball, yeah. football, like for me, like water polo that ended in like your early twenties and jujitsu is something that you can start at any time and keep pursuing at any time. And you're never at your end. Like you're just, it's a continual quest of growth and getting better and changing your output. And I think it's really easy to lose sight of that when you're in the trenches of a uh, I don't know, coming up in the belts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jiu-jitsu is great for all ages. Say that, you know, period. Great for all ages and all types of people, whether you're a computer programmer or a surgeon or former collegiate wrestler or, you know, the petite little female who just wants to learn some self-defense and be more confident. It, awesome. You know, it's good for everyone and it builds discipline and adaptability. Uh, so it, it's a great sport for, for those things. And, um, and it, the learning never ends. 
there is always more to learn. You know, the, the analogy I draw between uh, the black belt is it's like getting a medical degree. You've put a lot of time and effort and not a lot of people get there, but you really don't know much. <laughs> you don't know a lot. And there's still so much more to learn uh, that you carry on into what is hopefully 30, 40, 50 more years. So, uh, yeah. Love it. So what are some, and I don't know if, I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this, but what are some of the most common injuries you see in jujitsu or like submissions that you're like, Oh, yeah. God, I don't <laughs> like this. I don't like that. This is a submission. Like what makes you cringe? Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, uh, my focus being on hands, the jujitsu it's rough on the fingers. Yeah. No way about it. Um, so personally, I, I kind of step away from putting on the gi and then I wear these kind of gloves that that buddy tape my fingers and help prevent injuries. Um, so, yeah, a lot of finger injuries with jujitsu. Um, there's, you know, a lot of the times things come up with fighting through a submission that, hey, you're trapped. It's OK. Let that ego go. Tap. Come back to fight another day. Uh, cause it did not do you any good to get your elbow popped in that arm bar. Didn't help you. Um, so yeah, elbow hyperextension injuries from arm bars. Um, there's sh certainly shoulder injuries from getting sprawled on or the arm pulled back with the Americana. Uh, we talked about ACL injuries. Um, you know, we could certainly, this talks about the heel hook. Um, the heel hook is a very interesting submission. It has um, perhaps a bad reputation in some circles. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to, to train in San Diego with guys like Dean Lister, where foot locks and the heel hook game have been around for a long time. Um, but the, the, the concern about the heel hook is that it, it, it is attacking the knee and the ligaments of the knee, especially that ACL, there's not a lot of nerve endings and there's not a lot of warning that, Hey, something bad's happening. And so if you as a practitioner of the sport don't recognize what you're involved in, whether you're applying the submission or the person who's being attacked, don't recognize the trouble they're in, you don't have much warning before, boom, you know, the, the ACL goes and that's a, that's a setback. So education and good coaching and experience with the heel hook is crucial, but it's part of the game. And if you're if you're a coach not teaching the heel hook, you're doing your students a disservice at this point because it's it's part of jujitsu. You got to know, like, <laughs> if your body's not going to give you that signal, then your brain has to recognize this is not a good position for me to be in. Warning sign. Right. All right. And that it takes learning. And I'm fine with people not teaching the brand new white belt heel hooks. That, that's reasonable. But people need to be introduced and learn respect and how to do it. And then they learn how to to uh, realize when they're in, in trouble. Because that's not something to push through, despite maybe what we see sometimes, uh, <laughs> letting that yeah. go in all different directions. <laughs> you know, and the culture is expanding. More and more people are doing it. And not all of us have the ambition to be the world champion on the biggest stages. And um, there's no point in limping around because you wanted to fight through a heel hook because your ego is so big. It's, it's, it's silly. It's silly. I definitely agree with that. I was interested to see like what your, what your thought on or what your thought was on some of these submissions that are, you know, like maybe riskier than other submissions. And I think that's a really great example of that. Yeah. And there's a lot out there, but I mean, you can get hurt in anything if you're not smart, um, you know, tap out, tap early. It's cool, you know, um, and a big, big thing of jujitsu, along with adaptability and and um, discipline is humility. Um, that's a big thing. Everyone, even the best guys in the world lose. And you can be Gordon Ryan, but I guarantee he's tapped out to people and he's gotten injuries. And so you learn to be humble and that's okay. You get beat sometimes. Learn from it. Come back stronger. Still be able to do your day job. Okay. Absolutely. Well, I this is a little bit of a tangent, but I figured while you're here, it'd be really interesting to ask your opinion on this. 
And um, I have two little boys that are both very competitive little creatures. And it's weird. I have no idea where they got that kind of thing. <laughs> um, but it's wild to see the culture of youth sports now. And I've been in strength conditioning for a long time. We've known it's always, there's a lot of overtraining. There's a lot of early specialization. What are you seeing as an orthopedic surgeon in some of our younger athletes so that maybe any parent listening can have some, some of their own like red flags to watch out for with our kids? Yeah. And I, and I can speak to this as a, a parent too. And, and um, so one youth sports, getting your kids active in whatever, super important. Sports for kids. Great. And you let them have a chance at kind of choosing what they like to do. Now, Unfortunately, there's this culture and you know, part of it may be the, the 10,000 hour rule. Part of it is these select teams that um, you know, won't take your kid unless he's been around with that coach for a few years. And there's competition even with these six and seven year olds. And it's just it's, it's crazy the culture that has come up around these sports. And so you've got and especially in San Diego where the weather's pretty good. You, know, you can be playing soccer year round. You can be playing baseball year round. There's no rest. There's no break. Um, and that's where problems start coming up from an orthopedic standpoint. One, there's not good recovery Two, those muscle imbalances start coming up. There's no cross training. Uh, the kids burn out and, and injuries start popping up. You know, perhaps we're a little more attuned to injuries, but you know, we didn't used to see these little kids with, with, you know, needing Tommy John surgeries, which is a whole other ethical, moral thing. But, um, you know, it's crazy what happens to, in some of these youth leagues, youth sports, the pressure being put on these kids to keep performing and and injuries come up because of all of these things. The, the, the imbalance of the musculature, the overtraining, the burnout, it all contributes to injuries and the culture of youth sports needs to change. And as we were talking about cross training, it helps. <laughs> it helps keeps these kids if they're really into it. Stay injury free, stay fresh, stay out of the burnout zone of the sport they're in, and they come back better. Um, you know the, the Tiger Woods stories where they're just these project uh, prodigies at age three. Those are the exceptions. You know most of the people who become excellent at their sport, they're doing other things, and they don't decide until later on in life what they're really good at. And you hope that the system gets built where cultures can maybe take a step back and go, hey, maybe I haven't been working with this kid for the past six years, but man, this 12 year old's got potential and they've really got an affinity for this sport. Let's give them a little extra attention. Let's, let's get them into this, even though they don't know anything about the sport at this moment, you know? I think it's so easy to lose sight of that. You know, I used to coach division one, um, coach in a division one collegiate environment. And when I would recruit the best re like the best athletes, the best people that I would recruit to come in were those that were playing multiple sports, even through high school. Those were always the top recruits were the ones that weren't just doing the sport I was recruiting them for, but also had, you know, experience in other sports that they were consistently playing. I think, like you said, it balances a, it prevents a lot of burnout in one particular sport, which especially with female athletes, that mental emotional toll, that burns them out and help like male athletes too. so early, you know? Um, and so it's just been, it's been so interesting to see it probably over the last 20 years, just uh, how much worse it's gotten, even though we, we are seeing the red flags in medicine, in strength conditioning um, as parents, I think we see like, you know, this isn't, this doesn't feel right for my kid to be practicing this many hours, this many days a week, um, this season into the next season where now there's club or there's travel or whatever, like we yeah. are in a position to choose differently yet. It's just not part of the culture, despite everyone on who's like working with these people saying, hold up. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's a cultural thing. Um, you know, whether it's parents wanting the best for their kids and want their parents or want their kids to achieve great things. And this is what they think needs to be done for those kids to achieve great things because the coaches tell them um, it or the other parents who their kids are competing with are doing this. And, oh, man, I've got to do that, too. And 
it's it's just a weird weird culture. Um, certainly, parents have a say. Kind of, there is some intuition, like, man, you know, this is the fourth practice in three days, and the kid's exhausted, and he's not having fun, and he's ten. Like, he's probably not going to want to play this sport much longer. So, yeah, changing it up, having the parents realize, like, hey, it's okay to take a step back, get Timmy back doing other things, let him have fun. I mean, that's such a huge part of it. If, if you're not having fun, why do it? Um, what's the point of doing, you know, high level sports if you're not having fun? So and that's keep like, the fun in it. Right. That's across all ages. If we're talking about this lifetime of athleticism, it's almost like prioritizing the joy and the fun and the play of it. And then the performance. And I think like I'm falling victim to that in my thirties where I'm like, is jujitsu fun or am I like turning myself <laughs> crazy because I'm getting more competitive or I put more pressure and expectation. And it's like, that doesn't go away, whether you are 13 or 30 something, there's still this athlete brain of, uh, you know, it's like that FOMO culture, that high expectation mm -hmm. and the environment that you're in and what that is supporting or not. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, and, you know, we've been talking a lot about balance, but yes, you need to work hard. You need to push. You need to get through things that are uncomfortable and you may not want to do at that moment to become resilient and better at things. But and I guess, it, it, you know, the, the philosophers talk about whether you're concentrating on the process or the outcome. And if you're if you're just focused on an outcome, it, you're going to burn out and it's and it's not necessarily fun. But if your goal is to learn, have fun, be with your friends and do well in competition, like you're going to you're, you're going you're gonna to be that much more willing to come back after a bad day or work that much harder even though it sucks if you're if you've got those kind of goals absolutely and i think it's so beautiful when we as the adults can really help model that um for our kids so that they're seeing us pursue a balanced lifetime of athleticism to the best of our ability and also trying to instill that in in them and what their participation in sports look like right yes as parents we we can at least model behavior um, it's good for us, but by our kids seeing it, you know, it plants the seed. You know, I can't get my daughter to do jujitsu. It's a disappointment for me, but I'm not going to force it on her. But she sees that I'm active, I'm doing things, and she's going to find her way. And and it's because I'm trying to keep going, do it active, and and make that part of my life that she's going to go. Hey, you know, yeah, I like I like doing this. I like doing indoor rock climbing and or whatever it is. Um, so it's, it's our duty as parents to model good behavior and let our kids then take that and find what makes them happy. That's such a great example. And Hey, maybe she'll start jujitsu when she's like a mom, you know, <laughs> like who knows, <laughs> who knows what her catalyst will be for it. <laughs> right. You, you never know. And, uh, I don't want to put a bad taste in her mouth by forcing her to do it. Um, so I, I hope, I hope if she comes around to it, we'll let her do it on her own time. Well, that's a lot of wisdom as well. All right. Last um, kind of funny question. So you get to train with Jocko. What is that like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So a few things. So he's, we, we talk about just kind of the physicality of some people and he is strong yeah. and he will not give up and he's smart. You can't trick him. He's seen just about anything you can try to do in jujitsu. Um, so it forces you certainly to be better. And um, it's one of those cool things where you kind of, hey, I'm never going to be as strong as him. Never. But if my conditioning is good and I can keep moving and I've got some speed, then maybe I can start finding some angles on him. Uh, so, yes, it, there, there's all those lessons. He's a, an incredible person to be, be around just philosophically life lessons, just being able to, to bounce ideas off the guy, see how he lives. You know, he, there is a persona of Jocko, but it, it is how he is. He lives a, 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 the life he preaches. So, um, definitely a good guy to be around. I've learned a lot of jujitsu and life from the guy. And I, I count my blessings to be around him. 
That's so awesome. I think it's incredible, like the culture in which you surround yourself, the people you train with, the people you learn from and with all of that just truly helps support our, our growth in our career, in our sport, and kind of just as a human. So I think uh, you do an incredible job of living. Culture. <laughs> yeah. Culture is important. Absolutely. So where can people learn more about you and find any resources that you have available for uh, for all of us? Yeah. So I practice in San Diego. I don't expect people <laughs> to fly out here, but got my practice through Synergy Orthopedic Specialists. Um, I've been dabbling in the world of social media. Uh, Dr. Underscore Lucius, Dr. Underscore Lucius is my Instagram handle. And I try to bring some nuance and subtlety to the world of, 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 uh, of uh, social media, talking of orthopedic surgery and, and uh, injuries and things that just pique my interest too. And then I've also got a YouTube channel, Cut to the Bone, where, where uh, I talk about orthopedic surgery in detail and it's, and it's uh, crossover with combat sports and been putting up stuff for a while and got a little traction, I guess, maybe, but uh, hopefully, hey, if one or two people see the video and learn something and prevent an injury or get through their injury, then, then awesome, I'm doing my job. You're an incredible resource and I'm so thankful for the time that you shared with us today and the insight, all of it has been awesome. So thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to do it. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practice Brave Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a review and help us spread the work we are doing to improve the overall information and messaging in the fitness industry and beyond. Now, if you are pregnant and you are looking for a trustworthy exercise program to follow, I have you covered. The Pregnant Athlete Training Program is a well-rounded program for pregnancy with workouts for each week that are appropriate for your changing body. That's 36 weeks of workouts, three to four workouts each week, and tons of guidance on exercise strategy. We also have an at-home version of that program. If you are postpartum and you're looking for an exercise program to follow, the eight-week postpartum athlete training program would be a really great way to help bridge the gap between rehab and the fitness you actually want to do. From there, we have the Practice Brave Fitness Program, which is an ongoing strength conditioning program where you get new workouts each week and have a lot of guidance from myself and my co-coach, Heather Osby. This is the only way that I'm really offering ongoing coaching at this point in time. If you have ever considered becoming a certified pregnancy and postpartum athleticism coach, I would love to have you join us. Pregnancy and postpartum athleticism is a self-paced online certification course that will up-level your coaching skills and help connect the dots between pelvic health and long-term athletic performance, especially during pregnancy and postpartum. Become who you needed and become who your online and local community needs by becoming a certified pregnancy and postpartum athleticism coach. Thank you again for listening to the Practice Brave podcast. I appreciate you and please help me continue spreading this messaging, this information and this work. Mm -hmm.